Brethren, I want to say to you that I always, and I say this in gospel meetings and lectureships, I say it privately to a number of people, but I always covet, and that's the strongest word I can think to use right now, your prayers regarding my responsibility to God and to you as a preacher of the gospel of Christ and all that the New Testament says that is. From the standpoint of having all boldness to preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and then to buffet my body and bring it under subjection, lest after having preached to others, I myself am a castaway. If the Apostle Paul could request that as close as he was with God and as faithful as he was, he is truly without peer, then certainly I can request that and should. And I always want your prayers to be what the New Testament defines as a Christian walking the straight and narrow way of truth. Time is too fleeting, it's too short to tamper and play with things when it comes to heaven or hell matters. And so I appreciate that. I appreciate the sport that comes my way to do just what I'm supposed to do before God, and that is preach the gospel of Christ without fear, without favor, with determination to preach the whole counsel of God in all things. Now I'm going to preach part again of another one of the sermons I delivered down at Bellevue. Uh, all of it, of course, is one of the chapters in the book, if you care to see it. It's a bit longer than the first one, but this has to do with the biblical doctrine of love. Now, with some of you, this is going to be uh, reminders. It won't be new to you. It may be new to some. You know that in our English language, the word love is singular in expressing what it takes four Greek words to do. In our language, thus we say we love God, we love fishing, we love dogs, we love sports, we love Corvettes, we love our children, we love our spouses, we love our parents. And today being Father's Day, certainly we're mindful of our fathers. I thought today this is the first time in the 41 years that Jody and I have been married that both of our fathers are gone. In fact, both our parents are gone. It's good to have memories. Now, what will we do without memories? So we love our country. We love music and different kinds of music. We love pork roast, Jeff, and roast beef, probably all of us. And on and on we could go. And we use that word L-O-V-E to mean all of it. Now, it's what we love and the context in which the word's found that determines what we mean in our English language by our usage of this generic term, love. You know, the old saying's been around for a long time. The Greeks have a word for it. There's a reason for that. And that's the reason Greek Latin is used in so many uh, scientific and medical matters. Because they're so precise. They're so precise. The Greek words for love are eros, phileo, or philia, one form of it. Storge. And you're familiar with this one. Agape. Or another form is agapao. Some years ago, and we've heard so much about this out in the religious world around about us, and it's true with so many things out there, it's all full of error. When I was preaching over Tennessee one time, and it seemed like all you could hear was agape this, agape records, agape bookshop, agape, it just agape. And you know most of those people didn't have any idea what they were talking about. And most of them, if they had an idea, it was a false one. Uh, and... Yet there it was, and I made a comment then, I have heard agape so much I could agape. Now that's not at all aimed at the truth of the New Testament on agape. If we don't have agape that's taught in the Bible, heaven won't be our home. And you can't live the Christian life without it. But that's what usually happens if you see the world messing up big time on its belief and teaching about a certain key 
principle of truth, just be sure it's very important. The devil's going to do that. He's going to counterfeit everything God has done, and he's going to try to say this is the way it is. And the sad part about it is, with most people, because we all look for the easy way. And too many people are looking for the easy way to the point of rejecting the way of the cross. Though they may sing, the way of the cross leads home. Uh, it's some other way they've chosen. And they fool themselves, they deceive themselves into thinking of the way of the cross. And they've done that with this very important Bible doctrine of love. So I want us to study just for a moment the different senses in which these words are generally used in the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, remembering that it's the Holy Spirit that reveal these original Greek words to the writers of the New Testament, that it is God's Word. It's the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. I mentioned to you about, uh, or mentioned the word to you, eros. This is the passionate love with sensual desire and longing. And although the concept of sexual love is dealt with in the New Testament, the word itself, eros, does not appear in it. The concept does, well, the word doesn't. In America today, I hate to say it, it's been for a long time, grows worse every day. Most people think that the blazing passion of romantic sexual love is all love is. I, I stand amazed when I'm watching a movie that you can watch one, even back when we could halfway watch them, or we have some we can watch that are not somewhere out in the lust of the flesh all the time, with foul language and everything else. But I've noticed that, you know, you can have people about to be blown away, or you can have people uh, dying in the midst of all sorts of whatevers, and they all want to kiss one another goodbye. Well, they don't give affectionate, comforting kiss. They go into a sexual, passionate embrace right in the middle when the Indian's about to scalp them. Now, that just doesn't sound right to me. But that's all Hollywood knows, folks. That's the reason they're like they are. This is the only love they know. If you see television, here comes on a new show. It's advertised between something you can watch. And here it advertises, first thing happens. Man and woman, they look at one another. They get calf out at one another. They kiss. You know what next thing they do? Take off the clothes, head of the bedroom. That's all people know. And that's killing us in this country because everything comes in through that door that's base and immoral and of this world. I will say this. The devil knows what he's doing. He knows how to get his job done. So the whole Hollywood entertainment community they, they just succeeded in deceiving America and the world into believing that Eros is the chief motivational reason that many are attracted to one another. And, and thus, people get married on the basis of this love. And guess what? When it goes cold and they see some other pretty whatever over there, well, they don't mind. They don't have that love anymore. I don't love you anymore. And then they run off over there, and that's going to wear out after a while. And here they go. So nowadays, you've got people not even marrying. Not so sure in the long run if you convert those, that might be the better thing. Because if they've never married, they genuinely are taught the truth, fully believe it from the heart and obey it. Uh, they don't have a lot of situations they've got to change around in a lot of cases. Doesn't mean it's a good thing. But it means that some things are easier, more easy, let's put it that way, somewhat easier to adjust and change than other things are. But that's where we are. And then you see what's going on in the homosexual community, right up in the White House. When therefore people lose that strong, fiery sexual love, really it's the physical appetite of sexual gratification, for one spouse, I say again, they feel justified. They're deceived, really. And to believing that such excuses them to leave one marriage and form another or never marry again or whatever they do. So fornication and adultery mean little to nothing to many people in our society where eros is the only or chief concept of love that they have. 
Marriage therefore holds little to no importance to those who think of and are driven by erotic love or the unnatural lust of perverted homosexual relationships. Now, is this to mean it's bad? No, it's not bad. The appetite uh, for sex is not bad. God said at the very beginning, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, he made us how that's done. But he gives guidelines. He tells you wherein the sexual appetite can be satisfied. But most people don't like that. So they don't pay much attention to it. But anyway, that's what we see as ruling love uh, or considered as love. Uh, there's a, a lot of times just a, an emotional thing connected with it. But that's another story. All right, that's Eros. Then I mentioned philia or phileo. It pertains to a general type of love. It pertains to an affectionate love. It involves, you notice the emotions are involved in all of this. Existing between friends, such as, as good an example as any, maybe better than most, is the close friendship that Jonathan, son of Saul, had with David in 1 Samuel 18, verse 1. It actually is describing personal attachments, a desire or enjoyment of an activity. And yes, it can refer to the affection existing between uh, lovers in the sense of the married. You know, <laughs> you know, your wife and husband can be your best friend too. <laughs> so uh, all of that fits into that. But notice Eros and Phileo involve the emotions. Now God made our emotions. He made us emotional, so it's not wrong if they're governed by the truth. Because he also made us a free moral agent, free will. And we can will to do this or do that. I mentioned storge. It means the natural affection. Now think about that. The natural affection experienced by parents for their children or even children for their parents. Now this word storge does not appear by itself in the scriptures. But combines with other words that almost exclusively describe relationships within and between family members. Now, you know, Paul will talk about some without natural affection. That can cause all sorts of problems. That's why babies are neglected. That's why people can be what they are when it comes to treating their own family like they do, and seemingly it doesn't bother them at all. We read of horrendous things done to children by their own family. And that's because they're without this natural affection. It's been turned off some way. Whatever did it, I don't know. Uh, but they don't have it. Now, all three of the foregoing loves, eros, philia, sorge, involve the emotions, I say again, or feelings peculiar to each one of us, given to us by God, in the areas each word references. But this is not the case with agape, the love of 1 Corinthians 13. That's why it has been called the highest love. You can read it where they even use the Latin meaning the supreme, the sunum bonum uh, of, of love. It seeks another's highest good as the Bible says that highest good or defines that highest good to be. It's the love of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. How much did he agape us? He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is the love that caused, caused Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as a human being, knowing full well what was awaiting him, to submit himself to the truth that he had to go to the cross and all the ordeal he went through in the garden all the way to the cross and his death on it. It's, that kind, it's a love of duty, even though the duty to perform it is terribly painful. It's not the thing you would normally choose to do in order to be comfortable. It's the kind of thing that says, I'm going to do this because it's God's will, it's right, it's, it's what ought to be done, although it may kill me. Or it may put me in jail. Or it may do anything to me. And then when you read through the persecution of Christ in the early church, you understood why that John said so much in 1 John, my little children love one another. 
Well, he had an idea of the philia, but he also had an idea of the ultimate love is the love that leads you under any and all circumstances, pleasant or hurtful, that you'll do what God said to do. It's the love that you've got in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by their Babylonian names. Uh, when the king said, you bow down at the sound of the music and worship this idol, and they calmly said, uh, we will not do so. Our Lord is able to deliver us, but whether he does not or does, we will not bow down to your idol. Now, that's what we need, brethren. And uh, we may understand that more, especially our young people in the future, when it comes to being faithful to God and serving him. So it means an unconditional love. The love, I say again, of the highest good is the Bible defines that good. It means to prize highly and unconditionally. It always seeks the welfare and best interest of the object loved. John 3, 16, Romans 5, verses 5 and 8. That's the reason, to put it bluntly, that godly preachers preach sometimes what the people don't want to hear. It's because they actually love the people more than the people love themselves. And thus you point them to the highest good. If a person's in sin, he needs to know that sin's going to condemn you to torment. But God has made a way so that sin in your life can be forgiven. It involves your believing and understanding the gospel of God's power to save and the willingness to turn away from a practiced life of sin and from here on out to follow the teachings of Christ, no matter the sacrifice you must make. And that is the best interest of anybody. Persons in sin, the best thing you can do for them to show your love for them, the agape love, is to point out what's keeping them out of heaven. And we can't understand that. We need to study this a whole lot more. Now remember that, you know, let me say it this way. The church is a welfare state. Now let me define my term. Look what all God's done for us that we never could do for ourselves. Yes, welfare. Welfare, spiritual welfare. But, you know, even then we had to do what was necessary to learn the gospel to use our intellectual and rational powers and will to do what's necessary to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then we had to see the need of believing it and obeying it. But nevertheless, we couldn't do that if we hadn't made the way we are and God hadn't revealed His will to us. But God has because He loved us. He's done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And He seeks our best interest. He's always sought the best interest of mankind. So this love involved a rational devotion to God and the things of God. It therefore always, in every case, leads in God's one to relate to God and man, even as Christ did. Matthew 26, 39 and 42. And 1 Peter 2, 21. And Peter is saying there, he's left us an example. Talking about suffering. That we should follow in his steps. And that's the way, that's right. That's the way of love, to follow in his steps, even if it means traveling down that lonely road when nobody seems to care. It's not an emotional love. doesn't mean emotion's not there, but it's not an emotional love. In other words, it doesn't necessarily feel good to exercise it. It may make you feel bad, as Jesus felt on the cross, as he was nailed to it, and before he ever got there, when he was scourged and beaten and a crown of thorns upon him. But it was love. And sometimes we sing the song, Oh, love that will not let me go. Agape, then, is intellectual love having to do with reason and comprehension. And it's all tied in with one's human powers. Remember, God made us with those powers. To purpose and will to comply with with those in authority or those in command. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. We're taught in Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies. A lot of people have had problems with that. And how in the world can I love my enemies? Because they'll think about their love for their wife or their children or their husband. The Lord never commanded that. He commanded agape, 
where you can will even your enemy the highest good. Do you think Paul would teach those Roman soldiers? Well, yeah. Do you think he would teach anybody and show them the ultimate good, the way of salvation? Yes. And so can we. We can will anybody good, no matter what they're doing to us. He didn't employ, and it's important to know this, the emotional terms of eros, philea, a storge, but, but agape. Now, we see then, in personal relationships, Jesus did not command family affection or a feeling of kind personal attachment prompted by a sense and emotion. But the exercise of that love, that is a mental resolve, an exercise of the will to seek and do the highest good toward anyone, even our enemies. Jesus loved the scribes and Pharisees when he said to them, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, Matthew 23. Paul loved the church at Corinth when he said, For ye are yet carnal, 1 Corinthians 3, 3. You see, they needed to hear that because they can't quit the sin unless they know the sin and are caused to reject it and turn from it to the right. Peter manifested this agape love when he referred to false prophets as natural brute beasts, spots, blemishes, wells without water, speaking great swelling words of vanity, they themselves are the servants of corruption. 2 Peter 2 and verse 2. There's not any hate in that. It's all love. In each of the foregoing cases, you see that the truth was taught manifesting our Lord's and His apostles' desire for the highest good to be realized by those they addressed and described. And thus Jesus said, If you continue in my word, then... Are you my disciples indeed? And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So agape didn't change when the emotions and passions surged and waned. Such is indicative of its relationship to an objective standard. It always, in every case, will lead one to obey without question the commandments of God. Doing what God said do? And the way he said do it, and for the reason, and on occasion, there's more than one reason that he said to comply with his will. It is through the gospel that agape love proves the faith of man by soliciting him to choose between God and Satan. And one of the greatest signs of God's love for us is that he made us where we can choose. He did not make us robots. Robots have no choice. He made us... To be able to choose by exercising our intellect and our rational powers and to serve God or serve Satan. So he loves us to the point of saying, I want you to choose to love me. He loved Adam and Eve enough to make them and put them in the garden. And yet they had the opportunity to sin. And they did. But that's part of God's love, that he would make us free moral agents with an intellect and with our emotions and with our rational powers so that we can study and know his will. We can meditate on it day and night. We can apply it honestly to our lives in the practical everyday Christianity. And we can choose what's right even when it hurts. Agape is the highest love because it regulates with saneness and sobriety the emotional forms of love. You know what a governor is when you put it on a gasoline engine. It keeps it from running as fast as it is fully capable of running. Some engines are so powerful that if you let them run wide open, they're going to tear themselves up. That's pretty much the way we are. God made us to where if we choose to fill ourselves to the nth degree as long as we can with the lust of the flesh and gratifying it, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, uh, we can dissipate our life. We can burn ourselves out in just simply going after everything physical and of this present world. 
but God's given us His last will and testament, the Bible. And He has said you can live the full life, which means getting ready for heaven. That's what life's really all about. Choose what's right over the wrong, no matter if you have to suffer for it, and gain eternity with me in glory someday. But I must will to govern my life with the truth of God. So there's no form of love, no matter how emotional that rises higher in any way or in any way sets aside that love that always leads one to obey God's law. When people say, well, I love him so much and he loves me so much that I just don't have to do what he said, something's bad off. And yet all false religions tend to teach that some way or the other. But you really don't have to do what he said. But you do. That's how you prove your love. Just imagine, oh, I love God with all that I am, all I have. I'm going to prove it to him. I'm not going to do anything he tells me to do. How would you do it? I have great faith in God and Christ and the gospel system to save me. I know it's the only way. And I'm going to show God that I have great trust, faith, and belief in him and his system. But I'm not going to obey a thing he tells me to do. How would you do it? And God's made a place to try us and to allow us to grow and to develop. And how would we ever, how would we ever learn to be benevolent if somebody was in need. And he can't be in need unless he's in a world that he can choose and others can choose to put people in a pickle, in a mess. And thus, how do we develop the great blessings that are forming the mind of Christ in us unless there's a world that pulls those things from us? How do you show mercy when there's nobody there to show it to? How do you develop it? How do you show duty and how do you develop duty when there are no obligations and no place to perform them? How do you develop wisdom when anything goes? It won't work. This world is perfect for what God made it to be, to get ready for eternity. And by choosing according to the truth, the way of God, we're yielded and still and humble. And thereby, the mind of Christ is formed in us. Notice, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15, that is the American Standard Rendition. For one's family affection store day to exist and grow, one must cultivate agape. Because agape prompts obedience to the precepts of the Lord in all areas of family affection in life. I don't know how to be a husband or even what marriage is without instruction from the Bible. I, I, nobody knows how to be a wife without instruction from the Bible. Nobody even knows how to be a godly child when they reach the age of accountability and know what they're doing. Nobody knows how to do anything about these things except that they follow the will of God and you're not going to do it if you don't develop this love of the highest good, in this case, the Word of God. For there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end there are the ways of death. And so we must cultivate this love. If one would increase in philia, the love of affection and personal attachment, one must nourish agape. It won't let your emotions take you off into some wherever. It'll keep them regulated. Only in this way will God's truth guide one to a proper exercise of this philia. And unless the regulatory power of agape, love that always causes one to yield to the authority of God's word, is exercised in one's life, the more emotional loves may well lead one to violate God's will in seeking to express them. You want, you want to see that in a family? How many times? Just go to Walmart if you dare. And you won't be there long until you see a mother with one or two children. And if that first one you see it's not working this way, just don't wait long. There'll be one. And the child is usually pitching some kind of fit to get what it wants. And you know what you hear? No. No. Be quiet, Johnny. No. No. But there's never any discipline. Never anything like that. Never anything that would teach that child to respect authority. For a while, the only God any child knows is their parents. And if they don't ever grow up to respect them and their authority, what do you think they're going to do with God and the government? Well, look around about you. It's going on all the time. So the Bible's teaching on many things is ignored and discarded 
because they're let off with some sort of sick sentimentalism, some sort of emotional clap trap, and they think they love somebody. Love is not permissive in the sense that no rules, just do as you please. Too many relationships then, including marriages, are developed on the basis of the emotional love, eros, philia, and storge, with little, if any, agape present in them. And that's such a sad situation. I want to close this. Sometimes I get emotional on this, buddy. That's what I said a while ago on this, so maybe I won't today. I want us to remember, first of all, that you can find faith working by love. And the Bible says that's the way it's supposed to be. Well, faith working by love is another way of saying, if you love me, keep my commandments, because faith comes by the Word of God. The Word of God contains the commandments of God. And so, if you have confidence in God and you love God, you're going to do what He says. So I think a perfect example of the position and power and relationship of agape to the other kinds, the emotional kinds of love and a mortal's life is found back over in patriarchal age in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Genesis 22, 1 through 14. Through the eye of faith, we can see Abraham obey God as he takes Isaac, his son, his only son. This is Father's Day, isn't it? The son of promise, whom he loves. And rising very early in the morning. I've always said, I think you've been tempted to sleep late on that day. Begin a journey that would last for three days. Three days. Knowing what was at the end of them. Terminating at the foot of the mountains of Moriah. Father and son with their two traveling companions have come to the foot of that mountain for one single solitary reason. Because God commanded Abraham to offer his son a promise for a burnt offering to him. The father of the faithful tells those traveling with father and son to wait while he and the lad climb up on old Moriah for the worship. And by the way, this is the first time, think of the significance of this, this is the first time in the Word of God that the word worship is used in the Bible. However, it's from the New Testament of the Christ that we learn that Abraham thought God would raise Isaac up from the ashes of the burnt offering. For the grand old father knew all the promises that God had made to him depended on Isaac living. And he knew God did not make promises he would not keep. God did not contradict himself. Read Hebrews eleven nineteen. No wonder then that following Abraham's comment to those who accompanied them on their journey to remain behind, that the faithful patriarch in full confidence, great faith, told them, now watch it, think about this, that following their worship, he and the lad would return again to you. Genesis 22, 5. Well, following these comments, Abraham takes the knife, the fire, and look what he did. And laying the wood on his son, he's not a little child, is he? Father and son begin to climb the mountain together to engage in the worship that Jehovah had commanded them to do. What fatherly emotions must have pulsed in the heart of the old father. When Isaac asked him, where's the lamb? It was Abraham's agape that answered the curious son. And here's what he said. God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Then Abraham built the sacrificial altar. Scripture says he laid the wood in order. As he bound his son, if not before, certainly by then, Isaac knew what must be. So you cannot help but appreciate his own cooperation 
even though he was to be the offering. More than this is the fact that Abraham fully realized that Isaac also clearly grasped what God had commanded his father to do. And there's no rebellion on his part. With his arm outstretched and the knife poised to do the bidding of Jehovah, his angel, the angel of the Lord, stayed the aging father's hand. And you know the rest of this great account that Moses gave us of a faith tried and a faith proved and agape love radiant and shining. God provided a ram for the sacrifice and together Abraham and Isaac returned to the waiting servants at the foot of Moriah as he promised they would. Now Abraham knew the measure of his own faith in the great I Am. Can anyone begin to imagine the rejoicing that must have burst forth from Abraham and Isaac in thanksgiving and praise to the God who would, in the years ahead, give His only begotten Son upon the cross of Calvary on our behalf. But there'd be nobody to take His place. He tread the wine press alone. There's the epitome and the perfection of the ultimate seeking of others' good. Abraham controlled the emotional loves of Storge, Philea, by loving God supremely with agape. And this is the case because agape rejoiceth not in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Agape is the prime mover behind being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 5.58 And thus the love must be present in the one who is faithful unto death. Revelation 2 and verse 10. And it will have been the undergirding factor in the lives of those and their hope faithfully serving God all the days of their lives so they can hear fall upon their ears from the lips of their Savior. Well done. Good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Brethren, when God asks us to be fathers by first becoming husbands in a marriage, look what he has given us in the example and look at the power that we have for good. However, Abraham's faith in God and the hope he placed in his promises, which promises were to be performed, as you know, through Isaac, were by themselves inadequate. Abraham's love, agape, for God had to lead him to obey God's commands, no matter the cost to him personally. So the greatest, the greatest of faith and hope and love is love because it undergirds all things. And so the choices are ours to exercise that love that always leads one to submit to God's will because he knows what's right, whether we understand it or not. He knows what we need. And to put aside those emotions that tend to sometimes say, don't do that. It's easier to do it other ways. It feels better to do it other ways. Don't get, don't get people upset with you. And yet if you love them, you'll go to the cross. As it were, when Jesus said to us, take up your cross and follow me. Yes, today's Father's Day. I wish we could benefit more and earlier in life from the truths of God's will, for they have so much to tell us about what a father is. Because remember, we have our heavenly father that we address, saying, hallowed be thy name. If you're a subject to the call of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, he offers his gospel to save you, please receive it in believing in Christ with all your heart, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in him, and obeying Him and being baptized for the remission of your sins. Rise up, 
to spend whatever time we have left, and we know not how long that is, to serve him faithfully. For I tell you, there is looming out before us an eternity that does not end. And if you have anything on your mind and you're thinking rationally, when it comes time for that heart to beat its last, you think you'll be concerned about your bank account, or Social Security? No. You'll be concerned about that eternity and coming before the judgment bar of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Because we go to our long home, as the prophet said, when we leave this world. If you're subject to the blessed call of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.